the 1st of February 1992, OTC and Telecom merged to form the Australian and Overseas Telecommunications Corporation Limited, Australia's leading worldwide communications company and one of the country's major corporate assets. The story of OTC is also a chronicle of Australia's entry into the global marketplace. It is a story, therefore, of national and international significance. Telecommunications Commission Australia, OTC was formed in 1946 by an Act of Parliament. Its charter was to operate and maintain Australia's international telecommunications services. To do this, it would acquire the cable and radio holdings of its predecessors, Cable and Wireless and AWA. These holdings included the Coastal Radio Service, which at the time encompassed 22 stations operating in Australia and New Guinea. In those early days, Australia communicated with the world via telephone calls, telegrams and picturegrams, which were transmitted and received by radio and a few long-established submarine cables. In the mid-1950s, OTC established two new international radio stations west of Sydney, a receiving station at Brinjelli and a transmitting station at Doonside. OTC's fledgling network was thoroughly tested in 1956, when Melbourne hosted the Olympic Games. Some 15,000 telegrams and 2,200 picturegrams were transmitted around the world during an intense three-week period. The network had passed its first major test, with integrity intact. The Olympic experience, though, highlighted the need for an increasingly sophisticated network in order to satisfy growing demand for worldwide communications. Australia was eager to take its place on the world stage. By the late 1950s, planning had commenced for a round-the-world submarine cable system, capable of providing 24-hour interference-free voice communication. OTC acquired a site at Paddington, midway between Sydney's business district and the Bondi Beach landing point of the proposed cable. To build an international telecommunications centre as the junction, or gateway, linking Australia's national and international networks. The Australian end of the Commonwealth Pacific Cable, which linked Australia and New Zealand to Canada via Fiji and Hawaii, was landed in April 1962. An inaugural ceremony took place at Sydney Town Hall the following year. Hello. Hello. Bob? <laughs> Hello, Alex. Bob, it's you. Yes. Sure. What are you doing? Are you playing cricket? <laughs> well, I'm sitting in the town hall in Sydney, blinded with light, and looking at the most dubious collection of people in the hall. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're in much the same position as me. That's what it comes to. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Alex, let's be clear about this, old boy. This is the first time in record when one thistle has spoken to another. Well, that's true. <laughs> The Seacom cable, linking Australia to Southeast Asia via Guam, was landed at Cairns in far north Queensland in 1965. OTC built and operated additional cable stations along the Seacom route in Cairns, Medang and Guam. A satellite in synchronous equatorial orbit at 22,300 miles altitude will always be in direct line of sight of a fixed area below. Three such satellites could cover the entire globe. 
The early 1960s was also a period of experimentation with satellite communications. The multi-member nation International Telecommunications Satellite Organization, Intelsat, was formed in 1964 with 11 founding signatories, including Australia, represented by OTC. The consortium's first satellite, Intelsat-1, or Early Bird, was launched in 1965. When the North American Space Agency, NASA, commenced its Apollo project, OTC was contracted to provide Earth station support from Carnarvon in Western Australia to link into NASA's spacecraft tracking network. In 1966, Australia's first live satellite television broadcast took place between the Carnarvon Earth Station and London, England. Good morning. We are here at this very early hour to make another step forward in television history. One which, we hope, will bring us the most distant person-to-person -person television transmission yet undertaken in the world. A step which should forge a new link between Britain and Australia. And waiting down under there for us is Kim Corcoran, so come in please, Western Australia. Come in, Kim Corcoran, it looks as if you've got a lovely summer afternoon down there in Western Australia. Hello, Raymond Baxter. Yes, here we are. It's 2.30, your timing is right, the day is right. I feel like a general about to lead off a, a small army here, as so many of the townspeople and the younger people have turned out for this special occasion of this live telecast, this first live telecast from Australia. Here they are all around me. OTC continued to expand its satellite facilities with the opening in 1968 of a new Earth station at Moree in New South Wales. This station provided commercial satellite communication services to North America and Asia via the Pacific Ocean Region Satellite. And it received incoming television and other services for the Australian networks. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. By 1969, Carnarvon was providing full-time tracking, telemetry, command and monitoring support services for Intelsat satellites over the Indian and Pacific Ocean regions, as well as continuing to support NASA missions such as the Apollo 11 lunar landing. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May. Look at the size of that rock. In the same year, another OTC Earth station commenced operation. It was built on the edge of the Nullarbor, about 30 kilometres from Seduna in South Australia. The Seduna station initially provided communications between Australia and Europe via the Indian Ocean Region satellite. To this day, the station remains an integral part of OTC's network, playing an expanded role in the provision of worldwide communications. It was also in 1969 that Sydney head office staff moved into new premises in Martin Place. To meet ever-increasing demand for telecommunications capacity, planning commenced in the early 1970s for new cable systems in the region. And OTC acquired a site at Broadway in Sydney, which would house additional computerised exchange facilities. Automatic switching at Broadway and Paddington exchanges allowed the introduction of subscriber-to-subscriber -subscriber telex services. And in 1976, the launch of 0011 the direct dial telephone service, then known simply as ISD. My mother goes up to London once a year for 
for her brother's birthday. And, God, I hope she's all right on that train. I wish she'd come out here. But she says she's got her friends in her house. I miss her so much. Oh, she seems so far away. When you're thinking of home... Oh, darling! Go home on the telephone. The same year saw completion of two short-distance cable systems. Tasman, connecting Sydney and Auckland, and APNG, connecting Cairns and Port Moresby. The mid-1970s also brought an expansion of maritime services. Telex, or CTEX, was first, followed by the launch of a VHF radio telephone service, CFO, which became operational in Sydney waters during 1976. Discussions about the possible introduction of maritime satellite communications led to the formation in 1979 of INMARSAT, the Multination International Maritime Satellite Organization, of which OTC became a founding member. OTC established its Capital City Earth Station program in the early 1980s. The Melbourne Earth Station, located at Healesville, northeast of the city, was the first station in the network. The following year saw completion of the $400 million ANSCAN cable, linking Australia and New Zealand with Canada via Norfolk Island, Fiji and Hawaii. It was officially opened by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I now have great pleasure in declaring open the new ANSCAN cable. It's an enormous uh, pleasure to me that George Malpey is to be the next managing director. In 1985, the AIS cable connecting Australia, Indonesia and Singapore was landed at Whitford's Beach, some 20 kilometres north of Perth. OTC continued to expand its presence in Western Australia with the construction of cable and satellite earth station facilities on its international radio station site at Nangara, a few kilometres inland from Whitford's Beach. The Perth Business Office was also opened in St George's Terrace. OTC stepped up its offshore activities in the mid-1980s, including the construction of satellite earth stations on the Cocos and Christmas Islands, and several earth stations on Australian bases in the Antarctic. Foreshadowing a liberalisation of Australia's telecommunications industry, OTC introduced a new logo and corporate visual identity in 1987. This heralded a major change in corporate strategy, from being technology-driven to market-driven. A subsidiary company, OTC International, was established in late 1987 to manage OTC's growing offshore business. One of its early projects was the installation of a satellite earth station in the Vietnamese capital, Hanoi. The 1980s also saw tangible support for OTC's offshore activities. Overseas liaison offices were opened in New York, Tokyo, London, Wellington and Bangkok. These would be followed soon afterwards by offices in Hong Kong and Frankfurt. OTC's first fully digital exchange was established at Scoresby, near Melbourne, and the third Capital City Earth Station, specially designed to incorporate digital technology, began operation at Oxford Falls in Sydney's northern suburbs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you, and welcome to OTC's first Sydney Satellite Earth Station. This centre is an important part of OTC's network and confirms our commitment to provide better telecommunication services for all Australians and especially for the people of the Sydney area. 
OTC's new head office in Elizabeth Street, Sydney, was completed in 1987 and officially opened later that year. Give me great pleasure then to officially declare the new OTC house open. In May 1988, the federal government's policy statement gave OTC the green light to compete in the value-added services market. And a new group, OTC Enhanced, was formed to manage the business. A few days before Christmas in 1988, the world turned upside down for OTC and its staff. resigned as Managing Director of OTC at the request of the government and of course that comes as a very substantial blow to me at the end of a very long career in this organisation. There was no time for staff to dwell on what might have been because 1989 signalled an extended period of activity that was to change the face of OTC forever. The organisation was incorporated on the 1st of April. A new managing director was appointed in July and an organisational review began that was to be followed by an internal restructure to prepare the company for its future competitive environment. Meanwhile, it was life in the fast lane as usual. OTC's offshore activities during the year included construction of a new earth station in Malta and one in Ho Chi Minh City as part of a continuing contract with Vietnam. OTC International's activities continued relentlessly in 1990 with the installation of satellite earth stations in Hanoi, Vientiane and Phnom Penh, the formation of joint ventures in Thailand and Hong Kong and the signing of several island nations as inaugural members of the Pacific Area Cooperative Telecommunications Network, PACT. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's fairly late at night, but not nearly as late as I'm often rung up from Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> so well, the opportunity to see you in your uh, pyjamas is going to be a, uh, <laughs> an important feature of this whole, uh, whole system. In Australia, 1990 saw the launch of OTC's first ISDN-based service. OTC switched digital, with a range of applications for the business community. International Telecommunications Centre was officially opened in September. This was the culmination of a major capital works program, including a fully digital telephone exchange, TTC and M facilities for Intelsat and the European Space Agency, and an Inmarsat Coast Earth Station. OTC Maritime launched Australia's first commercial Inmarsat A service via the Perth facility in mid-1990. A landmark in one of OTC's and Australia's most significant projects, the South Pacific Optical Fibre Cable Network was reached in December 1990. Representatives from 37 international telecommunications carriers signed construction and maintenance agreements for the system. The network, it almost goes without saying, will be of enormous economic significance to our region and the way that we interact with the rest of the world. The Australian shore end of the network's first stage, the Tasman 2 cable, was landed at Sydney's Bondi Beach the following year. Today's truly magic figure is one billion, but there are several other... 1991 also provided cause for celebration with the achievement of one billion paid minutes of both-way international telephone traffic in the space of a single financial year, for the first time in OTC's history. Two of the more innovative business services to be launched during 1991 were OTC Call Plan, Australia's first virtual private network service, based on intelligent network technology, developed by OTC's R&D Group, and the advanced facsimile.